Two forms of government have dominated in the West over the last hundred years. In one, big power is vested in the state, the government. In the other, policies dominated by the influence of big industry, big corporations, or big money. Well, 100 years after the Russian Revolution and 10 years after the financial crash, a whole lot of people all around the world are saying, are there any alternatives, especially as neither of those models has delivered on a promise of shared prosperity? Here in Preston, Lancashire, England, a formerly industrial city, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in many ways, they've seen 10 years of austerity. And partly out of need and partly out of aspiration, they're practicing experimenting with a new model. The Preston model. The Preston model. The Preston model. They're calling it the Preston model of community wealth building. And it's inspired by a model in another formerly industrialized city, Cleveland, Ohio, the Evergreen Cooperative Model. On today's program, a transatlantic experiment in cooperative community wealth building. This episode is co-produced with the Democracy Collaborative and the Laura Flanders Show. We're the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So what is the Preston Model? In a nutshell, it's a set of policies and priorities designed to keep and build wealth within a designated area by emphasizing local investment and procurement. Anchor institutions such as universities, housing associations, and hospitals commit to purchase goods and services locally, including from worker-owned co-ops, to spread wealth and provide more, better employment. And local government supports those efforts by investing its budget and public pension funds in local financial institutions and credit unions. Additional revenue to pay for public services and housing and more investment comes through public ownership of productive utilities like communications or green energy. Preston is a, it's a very old authority in terms of the uh, local government in the UK. Preston was originally a cotton town. Then into the 20th century, heavy engineering started to take over. We built trains, we built trucks and buses and things like that in this area. And then by the late 60s, the economy was starting to modernise again. The council was really active, intervening in the economy, bringing modernity really to the city. If you fast forward to 2012, um, we were four years into the financial, um, worldwide financial crash. Uh, the whole of the Western world was trying to figure out how does it recover from and of course the council was doing the same. But certainly the ideas about community wealth building and um, Ted Howard coming over from um, America started to formulate these ideas of what the politicians wanted to do. Since the 1950s and 60s, Cleveland had been sort of systematically deindustrialized over those decades as manufacturing left the city. So the idea was, let us create new capital in the form of community-based, broadly-owned businesses rooted in place that could provide decent work and full employment opportunities for local residents. In order for people to really advance, there need to be additional ways to build assets, or we would say build wealth. And by allowing people and encouraging them to have an ownership stake in their business, as the companies succeed, they share in the profits. The thing that intrigues me so much is how far beyond anything in the United States, including Cleveland, the people of Preston have gone, both in terms of the concept, the broad vision of it, but also in terms of the actual structure that's being put in place. And it's both a testament to the sophistication of their vision and really their economic analysis of what's needed, but also to just the, the commitment and almost bravery of individuals who go forward and will not be turned back. So yeah, so these, these, these are going to be some more new businesses here. Matthew Brown's been working on the City Council since 2002 and became its leader in 2018. His public profiles on the rise having become synonymous with the so-called Preston model. I mean, what drives your passion to be a public servant? Well, we've still got huge inequality. And when you go up to the north of England, that is amplified, you know. We're heading towards an American situation in which you've got a small few hundred of people who tend to have about 30 or 40 percent of the wealth of the economy. And I don't believe you can have a democratic society if 
there's that wealth inequality because you tend to have a lot of influence over politics. After the Preston model, what's happened, there's been a real push and a real culture change to actually buy from local suppliers, you know, support local businesses especially, get a real living wage, get apprentices, get environmental benefits. And there's this kind of collaboration across the majority of the local public sector, which is really fascinating. It's bringing about results. So what does the Preston model look like in action? We headed over to the Gateway Housing Association, one of the committed anchor institutions here in Preston, to talk to community empowerment manager Paul Kelly and Kay Johnson of Sustainable Food Lancashire. So Community Gateway Association, the model is about, um, rather than the organisation just being set up as a business, it's about creating a governance structure that enables the tenants of our properties to have ownership of the company and to be able to choose a sense of direction of the company, approve all the policies and procedures that the company develops and have a, have a stake in, in the organisation. So it's not just run by a faceless board, it's run by themselves with professional support. We have 6,200 tenants, properties in Preston. We have five of those tenants are on our board, one of whom is the chair. And I think that keeps it very rooted in this place in the importance of this place as Preston. We're not an organisation that wants to have properties in Liverpool or Manchester. Or this is about Preston and the greater Preston area. And I think the model that was established here reflects the Preston model in terms of the people here saying, we want to do it this way because we want to have ownership of it. I can talk a little bit about um, what's happening from a food perspective. We've got, we've got food grown nearby about 10 miles from here the soil is so fertile that it is like some of the best growing land in the country the produce there goes all over the country and probably further afield um, and what we are trying to do is work with the farmers so it can be sold directly first of all to people in the communities who often don't get access to fresh local produce but also we're looking to scale that up so that we can supply to some of the anchor institutions here. Paul and I have just been talking about a fantastic um, idea where we're going to be providing catering qualifications to some of his tenants so that they can get work, they can maybe work and set up a cafe here. It's a bit like a gym saw that all the pieces are there and we're just <laughs> finally able to put it all together. Neil McEnroy is chief executive of the UK Centre for Local Economic Strategies. He worked with Brown to survey Preston's assets and find out where their money was going. I think what's important about Preston is the reason why we were keen on working there is that it had 130,000 people, it was self-contained, it had a university, it had a local authority, it had a housing association. Looking at its economic system change it had all the components there, but not too complex. It wasn't like a big city or a very disparate rural area. So it had all the components right for a medium-sized city to advance local wealth building. And so we looked across the range of anchors in Preston and measured what they spend their money on, where is, how much money is local, how much money is not local. For instance, only 5% of all of the £750 million of the six anchors was spent in Preston. So a 20th. After five years, uh, we've seen the change from 5% spend in Preston to 18%, which is equivalent of £70 million. Many of these ideas and principles draw from other forms of collective action. Historically, trade unions have fought austerity and the concentration of wealth and power. We talked to Jonathan Grisdale of Unite the Union about what's exciting him about what's happening in his hometown. We represent workers right across the industrial spectrum. Initially, the unions didn't see community wealth building as their issue, but we're all about people earning the right wage. We're all about them having a good quality of life, supporting people to have ownership within their own community. When my union found out about it, we invited some people along to a recent conference in Preston and they went, wow, we couldn't wait to get on board. So we've had meeting after meeting. As Labour's picked up this policy and made it part of the Labour Party policy, there is a community wealth building unit within Labour. Um, very much the union is tied to that policy. The biggest challenge in this country at the moment is social care. Social care is some of the most lowly paid workers, hardest working people, they're absolutely key to society. We can't move people out of hospitals into the community unless there's somebody to keep them well within the community. The care model at the moment is so tightly funded that it doesn't take a genius to predict the whole of social care could collapse on having to pay those workers what they owe them. 
We don't need bosses with shiny cars. We don't need people in suits. We just need people who give care. If we can support those people to give that care, if we can put an architecture in place that allows them to deliver that care without being exploited by an employer, that's union bread and butter, that's 101, isn't it? The Preston models generated a lot of excitement. What would this look like in other parts of the country? We put that question to Ornette Clennon, a researcher in Manchester. From our perspective in Manchester, one of the big things that we are learning is that the people that you're working with come with cultures and cultural expectations and various historical narratives and all of that impact on the participatory process itself. The question is, how do we embed um, culture and participation across the board? Tell me a little bit more about the Mali project. So Project Mali um, came out of a report um, in 2015 which was looking at why um, African and African Caribbean assets are being decimated in, in number. What we're finding is that certain communities and in our community we have a certain model of enterprise or entrepreneurial process which doesn't always align to the sort of Eurocentric or mainstream model. So in really basic terms, a lot of enterprises within the African and African Caribbean community are micro enterprises and small enterprises. In terms of Preston, I'd be really interested in learning about the participation of their ethnic minorities. When we really get into the nitty gritty and speak to the people who are supposed to be benefiting from this, you will find that many people are still going to be left behind. And they're going to be left behind because the whole sort of cultural narrative of who they are and where they are within their communities and the relationships they have with the anchor institutions, they haven't been dealt with. How I see this from a research point of view, forming a cooperative is great. On a practical level, that's really, really good. But you're still responsibilizing the people who are suffering from the deprivation. So there's this whole thing about resilience, because resilience basically says that you need to have these structures in place to be able to navigate the system because it is what it is, so you need to make the best of it. And this whole responsabilization of the individual, rather than looking at the structures that govern the circumstances that the individual finds themselves in, I think is really pernicious. The model in Preston potentially is a sort of sticking plaster. So in the short term, it is really good and it is really positive, but at the same time, not instead of, but at the same time, there needs to be a concerted effort to look at government practice and look at funding allocations to local authorities. Preston isn't the only place that's making noticeable moves at the municipal level. In Enfield, a primarily working class borough on the outskirts of London, the local council has taken the area's housing problems into their own hands. I'm Aditya Chakraborty, Senior Economics Commentator for The Guardian newspaper and we're at Debbie's Afro Hair Salon in Edmonton Green. I grew up about 10 minutes walk from here. Um, it used to be the kind of place where working people would aspire to move to if they were on their way out of London. It used to be a place of working prosperity and now it's a place of working poverty. People here may work two or three jobs a, a day to make ends meet, to put food on the table, keep a roof over their heads. I think a number of towns, cities, suburbs across Britain are now really understanding that the political and economic model that we've had in Britain for 40 years or so just isn't working for them. It's not delivering them wages, it's not delivering them growth, it's not delivering them political power. What's interesting and to my mind extraordinary about Preston or indeed Enfield is that they're among the first to work out what their response should be. They're about active local government, doing things which are unconventional, perhaps not relying upon big businesses to come through, make a token investment, and maybe leave some small change on the counter for the people in the locality to share amongst themselves. Instead, they're thinking about growing their own businesses or about using the public sector and public purse in a more active way. This is first new council housing in 30 years. That's correct. We were facing austerity because the government um, said financial difficulties, local authorities had to do their bit, meaning giving us less money. 
That gave us problems because statutory services that council had to provide increased as a result and um, we had to quickly think outside the box. We said first we need to start building council housing again. I always say right from the beginning housing is everything. Housing is health, housing is mental health, housing is children's future, housing is children's achieving good results and it goes on and um, the list goes on. This is the beginning of the estate renewal scheme which is right behind us. All big states, um, four of them, tall tower blocks, they're all coming down and tenants in these properties are moving from that to here. But we're raising the bar of building council housing which is quality. All these homes are now on electricity, they feed into the tariff. They have solar um, panels on top. And who builds them? We contract them out to a local house builders. So it's local supply chain helping local um, house builders as well at the same time. We intervened in the market because the market wasn't working for the many. The market was working for individuals. So by us intervening, we have now kept public money in public hands. Some may call that um, municipal socialism. I wouldn't mind calling it either because it's intervening at the right time and making the right decision to keep public money in public hands so we could spend more on children's services, schools. Mm -hmm. We could spend all that money that we've saved, health. We could spend that money, all the people looking after them rather than just making few other people more rich. This isn't a model, it's not out of a textbook. People haven't had like a whole corpus of literature delivered to them and they're following a kind of recipe. It's experiments and it's initiatives and it's things dreamt up in front of a laptop in the small hours in the morning with people thinking, well, what if I tried this idea? You've met Matthew Brown. Matthew Brown works all the hours God gives on what's happening in Preston and coming up with new ideas for Preston. And for a long time, he will tell you that he was pretty much a lone voice. It's much easier for a council or for a politician to say, let's keep doing the same thing as we've done for the last 10, 20, 30 years, even though it's failed. So what you're seeing here is people cutting cross convention and saying we're gonna strike out on our own. Last year, the Preston model arguably got its biggest boost when the National Labour Party embraced it. Since then, Matthew and many of the people we've been talking to meet monthly at these community wealth building unit gatherings with officials from the Labour Party. Kaylee Walsh is a worker owner at London's tech co-op Outlandish. So we usually attract quite a similar kind of person to come and work with Outlandish. It's, it's actually works really well because we find that the ethos is very important. So at least an appreciation of the cooperative values, you don't have to know exactly what they are, but be open to them and uh, people who just want to use technology to make the world a better place. Worker co-ops are there. The model is to prevent exploitation and to facilitate self-autonomy. And if you're delivering skills on a daily basis to an organisation, I think it's a right that you own part of the business, that you put your commitment and you, you spend you know, a third of your time or more. Also, organisations would see more productivity if they allowed their employees to become owners of their business. There's a lot of work around awareness of worker co-ops in the UK. Not a lot of people know what they are. I think I've, I meet a lot of people who are well within the co-op movement and can tell you everything, whereas my friends or kind of people on the fringes think it's a great idea but don't know what it is. All of that knowledge is not shared enough. And I understand why. Thatcher brought worker co-ops to their knees. She didn't want any worker co-ops in the UK. It's quite interesting because Jeremy Corbyn is our local MP. We supported the leadership campaign and we still take care of his website now. I think it's extremely important what the Labour Party are doing, but I think that the challenges will be the general public accepting it. And the main reason for me saying that is because anything that the Labour Party do is portrayed by the mainstream media as negative. But having said that, they're, they're also very good at dealing with that. They've been, this has been going on for a good couple of years now. They still, they carry on, which is the most important thing. To hear from Labour directly, we headed to the State of the Economy Conference to speak with John McDonnell, Head of Economic Policy for the Labour Party, and Jeremy Corbyn, the party leader, who'd become Prime Minister if Labour won the next election. So you've got a big job on a national level. Why are you paying so much attention to a place like Preston? The issue for us at the moment is we're in opposition, so we're not in government, but we are in control in certain local councils. So we can use those local councils to affect change at the local community level. 
And if we can affect the change at the local community level sufficiently, that will enable us to build up to a change at the national level as well. So Preston is an example of what you can do at the local level that we can translate into a national policy. And how does it translate into national policy? Well, what we can do is use the model in Preston to translate that into other areas and build that up. And that's what's happening. Uh, Labour councillors, Labour Party councillors who've been elected this time round are looking at the Preston model and saying, I'll do it in our town as well. And we can roll it out in that way. But can we share experiences, what works, what doesn't work? When we go into government nationally, we can encourage and give resources to local councillors to do that. So we'll spread it at the local level. But also we'll learn some of the lessons that they're learning at the moment about how you bring procurement together in particular, so government expenditure, how do you use that effectively to ensure change. At the local level, we're talking about local investment, community wealth building. If you take that national, does it not become protectionism? Yeah, can do. At times it can do. And sometimes you might have to protect a particular sector. We've just had an experience in, in the UK where we were developing a thriving alternative energy sector. The government decided not to protect it from external competition, undercutting, etc. So that industry has virtually been wiped out. So there are times when, yes, you do have to protect them and there is a time for the state to get involved Maybe not so much in protection, but for investment to make sure you have the skills and the infrastructure to compete in the market. Too many areas of our country are being held back by low investment, low quality jobs, low wages and slow growth. Inequalities of class, race and gender are very stark all across Britain. We promise to put economic power into the hands of the many to transform the economy uh, from top to bottom, doubling the size of our cooperative sector, putting key sectors, water, energy, rail and Royal Mail into new and democratic forms of public ownership. So if you have such a huge national personal and political problem, why are you looking so closely at what's happening at the local level? Because it is about a feeling of community and it is about a feeling of how people relate to each other. So you have to have a democracy in process at a local level as well as a national level and within your party and within your movement that holds people to account. And so the localism is the Preston model that we're using, but we got that model, or I didn't, but others got that model from Cleveland, another place in the USA where you've got post-industrial places that are basically regenerating themselves through local endeavor with national help. John McDonnell and I often say, it's not when I win an election, it's when we win the election. It's empowering of people. You even have a place for co-ops in your manifesto. Absolutely. Um, co-ops are something that's intrinsic to the British Labour movement. And across the world, they're massive. There's a billion people. One in six of the world's populations are either users or members of a co-op of some form. So what we're proposing is national investment, proper taxation for the very richest, and empowerment of communities through local spending, local investment, and empowering people to determine their own lives. Social justice, socialism. And when people ask you about the economic argument for all of this, mm. what's the evidence that you present in terms of statistics and data that it's working? In 2016-17, within Preston, there was 75 million pounds we've redirected to Preston-based suppliers. Across Lancashire, there was 200 million. But there's also the cumulative effect, which we haven't really measured. So we've been at this since 2012-13. So obviously we didn't get to that amount straight away. We had to go bit by bit. So you're probably talking about 150 million in Preston that's been redirected. But also job density. As I said, the amount of jobs available per working age person. That is one of the best in Lancashire as well, in the North West. All these things put, to put together is putting Preston on the map. Well, looking forward, we've got a big job in our hands. First, we need more and more people to realise we are in a cathartic, turbulent age of crisis. Not everybody accepts that or not everybody wants to accept it because they're doing quite well out of this. We need to feel confident and emboldened that we can build a better world, that we can organise ourselves in policy terms and in community terms and as individuals to actually see the alternative and to start to build it. And that's, again, back to Preston, is what they've kind of thought. There was hope and enthusiasm to actually get through this mess. 
the Preston model, the Evergreen model in Cleveland, they are not the easiest way to, to advance economic development, but they are the way to do it if you're concerned about equity and inclusion and really the long haul. Could a transformation like we've been talking about here in the UK happen elsewhere, in the US for instance? We'll continue this reporting in the weeks coming up. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. Thanks.